welcome. I'm supposed to raise my voice because I don't have a mic. I hope that's okay. It is with great pleasure for me to introduce Marcos Cruz, who has been here since last night, who joined reviews today, and who will lecture, as you know. And he will be with us for another two days to give further critiques. And I'd like to say a few things out of the array of achievements and activities. <coughs> Uh, Marcos is an architect, educator, researcher, and critic living in London. He studied at the Escola Superior Artistica de Porto. Um, that's coming out of the Italian, I guess. <laughs> and subsequently pursued a master's degree in architectural design at the Bartlett School of Architecture, uh, which he completed with distinction. He then continued, uh, supported by the Portuguese Foundation of Science and Technology, um, in the PhD program, leading the PhD student design, and is currently director of the Barnett School of Architecture in London at the UCL. He also runs diploma unit MR unit 20, and you see the chapter that comes out of that unit. He uh, has a whole array of teaching activities internationally, obviously at the Bartlett, uh, at University College London, the University of Westminster in London. University of California, Los Angeles, recently, University of Liverpool, Tsinghai University, and Feng Chai University in Taiwan, the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts School of Architecture in Copenhagen, and the Oslo School of Architecture, among others. In 2000, he was part of the design team for the Kunsthaus in Graz with Peter Cook and Colin Fournier that was won and successfully built. Uh, he's also uh, participating actively in practice with Marcos in Mayan, an office that was established um, after leaving the Bartlett, or well, in parallel actually, Priya. Um, and that office is not just about practice, it's about research um, invested in what we will see today, which is neoclassic architecture, but also others that lead to more practical approaches. His research is centered on a contemporary discussion about the body in architecture and the emergence of neoplasmic architecture, an investigation into sacred and the sublime spaces, inside-out urbanism, the use of digital and analog design processes as a method to explore and manipulate actual biological material. His research won the RBA President's Research Award in 2008 for his PhD. Marcos is a busy writer and editor, and I'll mention a few uh, uh, of the series of publications that include Flash and Vision by Forum de Maya in 2000, Unit 20, covering the teaching work um, by University of Valencia and Actor in 2002, Unpredictable Flash, Memesis 2004, and Marcos and Maya in dealing with the office work, Interfaces, Infrafaces by Springer in Vienna and New York in 2000. Five. I'd also point out this magazine here, which is AD Neoplasmic Design, and we have that in the library, so we get some treat follow up. And just talking about this, I'd like to show one thing, which is called Cyborgian Interface. <laughs> now, it doesn't seem to look that familiar, but that is Dr. Marcos Cruz. And it goes back to the time when, when I arrived at the Bartlett and I saw these images and certainly heard of Marco's work. And so joining the program, being with Peter Cook, um, it was a challenging moment understanding how the school works, what is expected. We heard a lot of, yeah, we've seen this, yeah, we've seen this, but it was about innovative original work. And it's not only that Marcos decided to investigate the relationship of body and skin, the body architectural space, and then he decided to wrap himself into life-size mock-ups made of latex. He also shaved his head. <laughs> Peter was very excited at the time, but certainly it was, a, it was a moment where I realized even more, knowing quite a bit about the school, that it is a radical uh, place to be and, and a very inspiring place to be, and I hope you will appreciate his contribution tonight. So obviously his hair has grown back. And it's a great <laughs> pleasure to introduce Marcus Cruz. Thank you.
Thank you, Michael, for, for this introduction, very personal introduction, which is was always very nice. And um, thanks for this invitation to be here, also to Yon and uh, the, the University of uh, Syracuse. Um, we just had this opportunity to meet in, in, uh, in Los Angeles at UCLA in the corridor when we were exchanging emails, which was quite interesting. And, and I obviously knew that Michael was, was here because we knew each other from the corridors of the Bartlett. So uh, in a sense, it's a bit uh, coming to, to a, a kind of familiar place, although I have never been here. Now, interesting when you show these images that um, at that time, I was not the only one shaved at the Bartlett. There were two other people that from in my life are actually very, very important. And uh, I guess they went through the same thing as I went. Uh, first of all, my current wife, uh, Wanda, was also in that master's and she also shaved her, her hair off. And as a Chinese, you can imagine the significance of, of this when a Chinese woman gets rid of her hair. Um, and uh, the second person was Marian Coletti, who's my uh, working partner and teaching partner. He was also in the same course. So I, I'm, I must admit, this master's was for me a very, very important and decisive moment. And I guess I went to London like a sponge. So, you know, there are these moments in your life where you, you, you move place and you're so receptive for whoever's around you. Uh, because that's what you want. You want a change in your life somehow. This didn't mean that I was unhappy where I was, but um, for a long time I had, I had a, a very strong curiosity uh, to know what the London scene was. Um, and from the distance was really difficult to understand. Um, now, the theme for tonight, um, which I entitled Neoplasmatic uh, Architecture, is something that I have been developing throughout these years in this uh, uh, PhD, which took me almost eight years to do. Um, for those that have been doing PhDs, they know what that means. It's a long, long time, actually. Uh, in particular, when you are working and sort of having a practice and also teaching. So you, you kind of, in the English system, you're wearing three hats all the time. Sometimes you're the student, sometimes you are the teacher, sometimes you are the practitioner. And it's a very intense period, but it was a, um, a great moment to develop new ideas. Um, I, will, I will try to explain what I mean under this neoplasmatic architecture. And Michael said neoplasmic architecture. Now, this was sort of a chapter in my PhD, why it is not called neoplasmic. I mean, just in, in, very, in a very reduced minute, um, and short brief explanation, neoplasmic implies almost purely just a sense of form and has to do with plasma. With plasmatic has more to do with the formation of, of conditions, growth conditions that are outside the strictures of the human body. Uh, this is sort of to kind of wrap it up. Now I will try to explain why I need, had the need to find this term. Um, a very crucial term for me, and maybe we could turn off the lights um, that we can see the images better. Could we turn off this light at least? A very crucial term for me was the term um, even more. Can you can you just because the images they would really require darkness. I think it would be would work quite well. Um, anyway, the, the term that for me is quite crucial, still in our days, is <coughs> the word flash. Um, for many reasons, one of the issues was that when I was doing the masters, and also from my previous background, uh, the word that I usually used was the word skin. And Peter Cook was my uh, main supervisor in the PhD, and at some point we had a conversation where he said, oh, you know, few years down the line, you will be known as Mr. Skin, because anything that has to do with skin, people will refer to you. And I felt, I felt very irritated, actually, because I felt that my work was to do with more than just skin. In a sense, skin was too much of a, of a constraint and, uh, uh, and a straight jacket that didn't allow me to do other things. And as, as you can see here, the word flesh is a much more inclusive term. In fact, it's, it's a word that has a philosophical dimension that in French philosophy is quite important and relevant. It's a very interesting word in English language, but it's very difficult to translate into other languages. Uh, at least Spanish and Portuguese doesn't have it. 
And uh, as far as I know, German doesn't have it either. And I guess many other languages can't translate this word because it's neither body uh, nor uh, it's meat. It's something far more interesting than that. And uh, th basically, how also this talk is structured is, is, structured is in, in terms of this investigation of what are the different possibilities of what flesh implies. And so the human flesh, the aesthetic flesh, the architectural flesh, the digital flesh, and this neobiological flesh, as I called it, imply different conditions in architecture. And I, I very quickly just uh, get you through what this issue of the human flesh uh, implied for me. Uh, as Michael mentioned, when I arrived at the Bartlett, one of the things was to get involved with a materiality and a hapticity in architecture where my idea was that we could have a sort of much more intense relationship with our surrounding. And I felt um, limited somehow to feel that we are humans and I remember all teachers of mine saying, you know, the human body is always the same thing, so why to, imp to change certain issues that are not necessarily dealing with technology when the body is the same? You know, we do the same things, we have the same needs. And I felt it so reductive, I felt it so annoying that we as a body were always the same and I couldn't believe it. Now, by doing these experiments, I did start <laughs> doing an investigation of different body conceptions. And this is not a study into gender or race, but it's about ways in which, in particular in the arts, the body has been conceived differently. And different authors have been, in, very, in, a, in a variety of, of uh, literature, have been talking about these different body conceptions. And here you can see just a, a very simplified reduced manner. The classical body, the Greek body, as being the body of posture and a body of harmony, as opposed to the grotesque body of the Middle Ages, which is almost the opposite, is considered a porous body, a, a, a very uh, ugly and unstable body. And the role of skin is quite important. There are lots of people talking about the, 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 the notion of porosity that the skin has in this period. Um, when you get uh, a bit later, and I skip on purpose the re Renaissance and Baroque body, um, I get into the, the notion of the body as a machine. Uh, the idea that we, we, for the first time, understand that we are, are far more mechanical uh, than, than initially we thought. We start understanding what is behind uh, what simply our skin is. And then comes a very crucial moment, which is the notion of the bourgeois body, which is brought in in the 18th, 19th century. Um, in fact, I, I realized that this uh, bourgeois body became my battleground, that became my big enemy. Because um, the more I looked into the, the notions of the mannered body, the female body, the contrived body of the bourgeois uh, period, I noticed that um, in the 20th century we're still very much in the heritage and leaving, uh, uh, living with the legacy of the, of the bourgeois body. This is a, just a selection of images of uh, the late 19th century type of body and in particular in the 20th century with the modern body. Now there is no clear image of what the modern body is. The modern body is many things. The avant-garde are so spread out. You have the futuristic body and you have the, the more standard modernist body. You have the more geometric body. Uh, and in fact the, the, the image becomes very unclear. And more in contemporary times you have what the majority of authors consider the cyborgian body. Now, it's not the cyborg in itself, but what I call the cyborgian body. So there is a sense of still constructing the image of what this implies. And important is that the, the cyborgian body allows a sense of deformation, fragmentation, and, and in the sense of being augmented. And you, you get, for instance, in the art world, Libul, for instance, talking about this completely monstrous type of body, uh, or Matthew Barney, uh, this chimeric uh, hybrid body, or Geiger with the totally immersed network body that you have here. And uh, I must admit, I remember giving a talk in, in, in Oslo, and it was quite a challenge to talk about these body deformations when the audience had the most beautiful <laughs> people in the audience, the most beautiful women and men sitting in the audience. They were looking at me and saying, why is he talking about deformed bodies? It does, we don't understand. In fact, for me, the realm that I had in my mind is Tottenham Court Road in central London, or Camden Town, or Shibuya in, in Japan, where in fact these things are far more acute. And probably in, in the States you have parts in, in New York and so on where this is, is far more part of our 
daily life than in, in other places. There's an aesthetic dimension to this. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but uh, what I'm calling the, the disgusting flesh. Flesh implies, in terms of its religious connotations, a lot of complicated things. Uh, obviously, the, the, the Catholic religion um, uh, and the, the Catholic Church always tried to oppress flesh, and flesh was always seen as the <coughs> visceral um, bodily thing that uh, one wanted to, to get rid of. And there's a whole problematic situation, at least in Western culture, between the mental, intellectual high level of, of things and the, the, the visceral, haptic, um, uh, bodily ones, which are seen as a, as a, as a downgraded, lower uh, issue. Now, these drawings that you see in the back are, are drawings that I was doing, partly doing the masters, and then I continue working them, uh, on them later on, which, which are sort of reaction that I had in terms of what, what could be the body in, engaged with its surrounding. They're more provocations than, than anything else. And then these ones are models that at the time I was doing where the body becomes involved in these communication suits um, that uh, occupy the facade of, of, um, of the architecture. The, the most important part probably is what I consider the architectural flesh, which is a metaphor. And um, it, it, um, it implies what, what I, I discuss are the inhabitable interfaces. And this is a study and an ongoing study I'm doing into in buildings that have to do with uh, this embodiment and uh, engagement of our body. Uh, again, these ones are a series of uh, models and, and drawings that I was doing where even in terms of coloration, the red and the yellow becomes this overheated, um, over close and, and uh, very uh, um, almost too <coughs> proximate uh, uh, relationship. There are all sorts of issues with prob problems of coloration and so on, which from a cultural historic point of view are quite interesting to, uh, uh, to discuss in, probably in another moment. Anyway, I mean, the result of all this was that when, while I was doing this in, in the year 2000, Peter Cook and Colleen Fournier invited me to join the Kunsthaus Graz team. And um, this is actually here on the right side the first model we did for that competition. Uh, it was the first 3D construction uh, that we had, and uh, we thought the building would be a very biotechnological building, and I just mentioned downstairs during the crypt that these nozzles were all supposed to move and to rotate around. Nobody imagined that three years later this would be standing there. It was a sort of revelation that anything is possible, in fact, and I remember Peter coming back uh, from from Graz and and he couldn't believe that this building was actually being uh, being built and that the initial ideas could be materialized in in, in, in this manner. Um, the flexible skin turned out to be a rigid one, but it became became mediatized, which initially was never the the discussion. Um, and the coloration changed as well because there was always a problem with the yellow, and yellow is a problematic, very problematic color. So. Anyway, I guess at some point when Matthias Osterhager was doing the final model, you know, and it was a transparent resin model, he just put a bit of blue in it, and that became the blue bubble, and from there on, the building became blue. That's how random these things happen, because there were actually renderings that were green, and there was the yellow model. So there was a certain definition, but blue worked very well, and it became um, the blaue Blase, so the blue bubble. Um, after that quite extraordinary experience of being part of this uh, competi competition entry, uh, Marin and I, we created Marcus and Marin in the year 2000, and we have been working on a variety of schemes, and this one was a direct response to the Kunsthaus Graz. Now, you have to think that the Kunsthaus Graz uh, has as its virtue that it's completely empty inside. It's sort of like a big, big blue wha uh, whale. It has everything in the skin, and it's empty inside, and the the great strength of the, of the project, and partly also the reason why it won, was that the jury looked at, at it and said, it's amazing how these guys managed to get rid of the program, because we got a, a pile of papers and describing all the small rooms that this building had to have. And by embedding it all in the skin, it disappeared, and we managed to get some really good spaces. On the other hand, I felt that the inhabitation of the skin, which interests me, could also do something else in terms of the interior. And in this new Tomohiro Museum in Japan, 
we were working more on occupying the interior rather than the skin and creating these series of vessels, as we call them the exhibition cones, uh, with this meandering path uh, through it. So you can see here some of these initial studies we were doing of how the different areas, the different exhibition areas where Tomihiro, uh, which is still a living artist, a uh, handicapped artist, um, had different periods of his painting career uh, exhibited in rooms that had different lighting conditions. So the light coming in through these openings in a variety of manners. So you can, you can see here a series of plans. So you would come in from the underneath, uh, from this side here, in the undercroft of the building, and then gradually move up. And then there was a, a layer of water. And you would get up to the, to the level of, no, this is necessary, actually. Um, so you would come up from this path underneath here and then walk around this. There was the, the main entrance with the old bi building from this side here. And then when you circulated around, sorry, around that, um, that main uh, void, you would get into the area with all the exhibition cones and this meandering path. Uh, so our aim was to really to fill the space and to create these inhabitable uh, cones. Just to give you a context in this analysis of inhabitable interfaces is that my suspicion was, and still is, that there are quite a few architects which I consider the wallists, <coughs> are architects that have been fascinated with the walls. <coughs> and uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the most liberating statement that architects made was actually to get rid of walls. There are, in fact, I found text in the Architectural Review of 1911 where somebody writes, we finally managed to get rid of walls and architecture is free. So there was a real issue that walls were constrained because they were obviously structural walls and there was too much of a, of, um, of a need to keep these very heavy, massive constructions. And the mo modern architecture wanted to be light and transparent and fluid and therefore the walls were an impediment. Um, much later, I noticed that there was a whole group of architects that still found the walls really interesting. And Le Corbusier, one, interestingly, is one of those. He actually has a statement where he says walls are absolutely amazing. He doesn't say it exactly like that, but in basically in, in, in simple words, where he says the walls are the real potential of architecture. And when you think about Ronchamp, I've been there quite a few times. I, I think personally that the space inside is not actually that great. But it's the it's these walls around which are superb. How much story and how much of secretness and hiddenness and how much of the architecture is actually lying behind these walls that makes the building. And then there is, uh, for instance, the case of uh, Aske, the Asker Jorn Museum of uh, Jorn Utzen that he never built with the inhabitable cones. And I found this, this project, I was not aware of it, after doing the Tomihiro Museum. And the possibility that you circulate within the walls of, this, of these exhibition areas and see the exhibits from uh, different levels. And then some more kind of uh, uh, known cases like the, um, at the Pompidou Center with you know, the walls on, on both sides with all the, the auxiliary program, Kunstausgrad, the Toyoito uh, columns, etc. cetera. Um, and this was a sort of response of, from our side where our projects fitted in, in terms of a typological arrangement. And I have to declare my bias, I'm very fond of typologies. In the London scene, at least, there, there are quite a few people, including Saha, that say that, again, when the typology was, was erased, that that was, again, a, f a, a liberating moment in architecture, and that happened around the 80s. Um, I, I personally don't agree, because I think the whole conversation of topologies is actually very reductive. And it's, it's in a way, a typology of the surface, I think, uh, more than anything else, whereas the traditional typology is far more spatial. And probably more than saying one is now or what we should be discussing or the other one is the past, I think there's a, there's a much more complementary system in architecture where we talk typologically and discuss things and we discuss them topologically, ecologically, morphologically, and there's a complementary system. I don't think one prevails over the other. Um, so back to the um, uh, new Tomohiro Museum, these were a set of drawings we were doing and it was very important for us to find a language. Marian was doing his own PhD and is a very different person and has a, a very different uh, sensibility for architecture than I have. So it's not always the easiest uh, uh, cl collaborative work, but I guess that's the strength of it as well, uh, is that we are different people and, um, 
and we don't think in the same mode. So the more we worked, the more we started to find a kind of common language of what we wanted to do. Uh, this was a quite important um, uh, model because the latex came back again for another project, the New England Biolabs, which was not far, for very far away from here in Massachusetts. And um, uh, I worked on something that I called the inlucent skin. And rather than translucent or opaque or transparent, uh, I, I couldn't explain what the word was, what our skin is, which is there is no trans, the light doesn't go through. There's a sense of embeddedness of matter uh, with a certain thickness, and there's, there's, a, there's a feeling that there's something in there, but we can't grasp what it is. And I felt that one as a much more contemporary condition, because it's not a modernist, transparent condition, and it's sort of beyond the uh, translucent of, of, the, of the 80s. So the inlucency is a kind of embedded um, uh, lucency. And it's also what Marian calls the two and a half dimensionality. So it's something that is not two-dimensional, two it's not three-dimensional, it's somewhere in between. And um, in, the, in the sections, we're working with the inhabitable roof rather than the inhabitable walls. And um, you can see here, this, the, 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 in, in that case, the laboratory cones were the vertical ones, and then the roof was inhabited with offices where the researchers were, were sitting. And this has been a recurrent theme in our architecture. It's funny, what we do are walls and tables. I don't know why, but this is becoming like the, the theme. And even if we don't want to, we end up doing a table or a, or a wall. And as you can see, this is, this is the roof, the in inhabited roof for uh, the Damak Sales Center. And then there's a kind of artificial topography of the, of the ground <coughs> and the tension between both. And I remember uh, a lecture that Wolf Pricks gave a while ago where he refers to this idea that usually more conservative architecture is almost in excess concerned with the ground, whereas the more avant-garde architecture is obsessed with the roof because the roof is the floating and the liberating, detached of the ground condition. And I think there's some truth about it, but I, I like to think that the, the, oops, the, what was this? The in-between tension, I think, is absolutely fascinating. It's not just the roof in itself and not just the ground. So, you know, as you can see here, these are images showing how the interior varies and how this um, <coughs> modular and, and, uh, and, and multi-formal uh, condition creates a, a series of different conditions. And then the artificial uh, topography, in a way, being the one that separates and, uh, and divides the different parts of the program of, of the ground floor for the sales center. In fact, the sales center is nothing more than just an open space without anything dividing. There are no partitions, there are no walls. So for us, stepping was something that made sense to differentiate the different areas. And maybe because of my background, uh, and I noticed uh, now increasingly more that I have been autobiographic because I guess that's what we all go through. I, I grew up and I studied in a city, which is Porto in northern Portugal, which is profoundly topographical. It's built on, on hills. So there's a sense in Porto when you drive over one of the bridges, and there are five, where the city looks like a small architecture model. And my, my thought is that it's not a coincidence that people like Alvaro Cesar came from there and that they build in a certain manner. It's because they grew up in a city that has exactly that kind of condition. Um, so my, my version is that in a, in a way I'm lo always looking for the ground. I'm always looking not just to keep the conversation on the ground, but to uh, mold and create something far more three-dimensional if the ground is flat. Uh, this, is, this is a case when we were invited in 2005 to design the Lisbon Book Fair. And, um, and, and uh, for the first time, uh, we joined these two parts of the, of the building, the cafeteria and the auditorium, which were always separate in this park in Lisbon. And uh, we thought it would be interesting actually to combine them. And although in certain moments up on this hill, they would be separate, two separate pieces. But on the other hand, they, will all, they would be also connected through this large staircase. So in a way, the, the rethinking again of this three-dimensional topography. Um, and, and as you can see here, when you would, would be sitting uh, or standing here where the cafeteria is, you would see straight into the auditorium 
and have a much more present and, and exposed uh, impression of what the auditorium is. Now, one of the key arguments of my thesis, and what I still say now, is that I think that a lot of today's architecture failed the body. And I think it has to do with the fact that architects <coughs> took it for granted. I think we all, maybe increasingly more people are talking about the body, and I just noticed it in the conversation we had today when we were in the reviews downstairs, which uh, I, I found really exciting. But there are lots of people that just think the body almost as this sort of standard figure that has a certain dimension, and that's what it is, and it's a functionalist body. And there's nothing beyond that. And there is a lot of literature, actually, in, the, in, in, in cultural history where authors have been, since the 80s, discussing the body very, very intensively. But in practice, architects don't read these, this, this stuff. Maybe some academics, but people don't read it, so they don't know what has been discussed. And, um, for instance, I, I just mentioned three people that said something indirectly about the body. I mean, the sociologist Richard Sennett um, talked about the sensory deprivation of architecture nowadays. And he talks about sterility and says that there's, a, there's a, in a sense, there's a professional failure where architects have lost active connection with the human body. Then an architect like Anthony Widler talks about the notion that form is mainly generated from outside. And he says, why not to think about the body and the human as a generative instrument as opposed to the abstraction based on process and movement that is going on so much in, in digital architecture in particular, in particular. And then somebody else, Mark Cousins, who is sitting at the AA, talks about technologies of indifference and possibly about what he calls architecture of indifference. And so he says what in architecture is going on with this indifference is that we are risking to deprive us from what he says the vivacity altogether. So our vivacity, our human vivacity, because it's sort of indifferent what we're looking at. And I think there's some truth about it. And in my architecture, it plays a, a role. It's in the back of my mind <coughs> without trying to be phenomenologist and, uh, and nostalgic about the body, because I think that's what the phenomenologists are, tend to, to do, which is to say, oh, we lost wood, and wood was this wonderful material. I, th I think there is a possibility to talk about phenomenology, but in a much more uh, um, future orientated manner. Um, back to the Lisbon uh, conversation, context was crucial. This, as you can see, that was the location of the auditorium and the cafeteria, which usually were placed somewhere else. And then there were a few follies uh, on, the, on the top bit, which became also quite relevant. We actually never built them. But um, they, they are part of, of a of a series of prototypes that we have been building and studying, which we call the NERPSTERS. And the NERPSTERS are, is obviously the term NERPS and the, the idea of the monster. So they're quite unpredictable constructions. And in this case, what we wanted for the folly, uh, fo uh, follies, the Lisbon follies, was to uh, drape around the body some predefined <coughs> body shapes. And we were often enjoying ourselves to imagine that if this is done with uh, memory foam, <coughs> you would have these negative shapes and you would have people and the public trying to sit and squeeze into these geometries that wear the body, but they were probably too narrow for what they, where they could sit. But with time, in a few seconds, the, the memory form would adapt to the body. And once they would stand up, they would remain with a trace of their body shape and then it gradually would go back to its, um, uh, to its shape. Um, the Nerbster that we did in, in, in Taiwan was not with memory foam, but uh, again has, had something to do with integrating the body in, in this position where there was a screen. And this was done in seven days with the students. And uh, we also challenged the, this Nerbster construction, which is basically just notching. It's a relationship between 2D and 3D. It's nothing new. It has been done now for quite a while. But it's still challenging when you have to be so rigorous in this process between the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional for things to notch, to be structural, without having screws or glue. Um, and here we, we're using a, a metal sheet, so the notching was between two different materials. This was the first of these NERPSTERS we did uh, with students of Unit 20. Um, and it, it was the most sculptural one because it didn't have really a function. It just wanted to test in a one-to-one -one scale what this technique was about. 
it gets pretty messy, I must admit. When, when, uh, the, um, when the drawings that you have to follow are not followed properly, it becomes really difficult to notch them all together because there are hundreds of pieces lying around and you need pretty clear, a, a pretty clear setting and uh, a, a manual, almost like an IKEA manual, to follow the steps of putting it together, otherwise it wouldn't work. This is the same Nerfster, actually, but flattened. At the time, we were invited to have a solo exhibition in this place in Hamburg called the ICP. And there was this big void, three stories high, and the, um, the owner of this place said, you know, just fill it with something. Uh, fill it, because the void is not so nice, fill it. And we said, fill it with what? What's the cash, what's, what's the budget you have? And he said, no, there's no budget, just fill it. And you thought, seven by seven meters, three stories high, you can't fill it with anything. That's, it would be massive and very heavy. So basically, we just flattened it and created this screen. Um, and it, it reminded us of, of the experience in, in the Istanbul mosques, where you walk into these extraordinary spaces. And there's this beautiful moment with the chandeliers hanging much lower. And they give you a, a human scale. And they're very thin and, and, and filigrane. And they give you this sense of transparency where you see the, the height of, of the space. Um, this obviously looks very different from a chandelier, but it was, was a reference that we, we took on board. And, and, and that then led us in a, in a later project in, uh, in Badajoz in Spain, where they asked us to do a museum extension for the Mayak, which is the museum for uh, Iberian and uh, South American art, um, where the, this was also supposed to be for bio, uh, uh, bio art, to create this canopy, this ornamented canopy, and where the light could shine through and create these shadow patterns that would vary quite strongly uh, throughout the day. Um, and here another, another case of a nerves that this was actually for a house, an experimental house in, in Lisbon, uh, which we wanted to build in the shipyards of Lisbon. And it, in fact, it's again, it's a nerpster. It's just a construction where, where the notching of, of steel um, would, would solve structurally the building. Uh, interestingly, when we took this project to the shipyard, the guys from the shipyard said, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's all right. We, we build ships like that. It's absolutely no problem. And when we discussed the Lisbon Book Fair, they remembered, because they were in Lisbon as well, they remembered the, the pavilions of the book fair, but they always found them very boring because they were very boxy. And it was for us interesting to know that the engineers in the shipyard are dealing with these complex geometries and find very boring what architects do because it's all very angular and straight and, uh, and boxy. And it's, it was kind of interesting feeling uh, that we are not the only ones designing and, and dealing with geometry. In the, in the lofting house, as we called it, the, the scheme of the inhabitable interface is coming back. So there's the challenge that instead of having the traditional room space, the program of, of the house is embedded in the walls. So the sleeping and, um, and storing and working, etc., cetera, is, is more embedded. And we, we're kind of forcing the walls to become the containers of, of the program. Um, also, the, 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 the ground again, as you can see the theme of the hovering uh, roof inhabited roof and the ground that was completely flat being molded so that the garage, for instance, would be the parking area, would be slotted in the ground, was creating this tension between the above and the, and the below. I flick through these ones because there are a series of other notes. There's this was one that we did, as you can see here, the, the IKEA manual that we had to give to these guys um, to build. And this was our exhibition table in the Venice Biennale in 2004. And important in this notching system was that the notching comes from three sides. So it's not just the two-sided system, and it makes things far more, far more complex. Here, a much easier situation was the striation of, of laser-cut uh, uh, plywood pieces done with the students of the University of Westminster for the final show. Um, but I show this because even without hardly any budget, we still like to construct something with the students and build our own exhibitions. Um, as here you can see, this was, for instance, the Bartlett uh, show in 2008, um, which became almost like a Wunderkammer, a kind of mysterious place with depth where the models were all exhibited behind. Um, we called it the blister wall. Um, 
and that, uh, in terms of what was exhibited inside, introduces me to the theme of the digital flesh. And this is a more contemporary conversation and, and I find a very challenging one because there's a lot of stuff in the digital world that tends to be actually rather flat. And the, the British historian Adrian Forty, I don't know how known he is here, but in, at least in the UK, he's a very, very important figure and he's sitting in the Bartlett. He wrote a very small text once where he talks about the problem of skin. And what he does basically is he suspects that there is a problem with this word, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that comes obviously from biology and it's one of the most important metaphors we use in, in the architectural jargon anyway nowadays. Every building has a skin. But he implies there that skin has a meaning of thinness and flatness. That means that when you talk about the building skin, it's always something flat and thin. It doesn't imply thickness. And he says in this text, there is no word that architects use right now that implies thickness. The jargon simply doesn't allow it. We have difficulties in expressing that, in expressing the depth of the architectural skin. And I found that very, very revealing. And his uh, intuition, I think, was absolutely spot on. In a sense, my response with flesh is trying to find, at least for me, a word that is, exists as an extension of skin. The digital flesh means that there is thickness and three-dimensionality and embodiedness and in, in, uh, embodiment in the, in the notion of, of what is digitally produced. Here you can see a case where a student of ours was working um, in this project in Turing for an ecumenical council and he's working intensively on creating an internal, would call it relief, <coughs> Because it's, there's no, funnily, again, that's a fun, funny thing. We talk about textures and we talk about the tectonic of a building or the form. But there's not really a word that talks about the depth of the surface. And traditionally, they use the, the term bar relief. Bar relief was something of a 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter depth within the surface. But we lost it because we don't do bar reliefs and therefore we work either on patterns and textures on the flat surface, which is almost like a a textural patternizing, or we work with tectonic form, but the in-between doesn't really exist, or not yet. And this was one of the conditions that was, this guy was working on, and um, he was also uh, talking about perception and, uh, and, and, and the depth in terms of our visual understanding. This has to do with a strain of thought um, in the unit where students, every year, maybe one or two, deal with the notion of the sacred and the sublime. We don't ask all the students to work on this. It emerges out of, out of an interesting moment that the sacred and sublime implies a discussion about ornamentation. It implies a discussion about the return of the figural as opposed to the abstract. It implies that the digital manufacturing has a quite incredible role to play in, the, in these future visions of how to construct architecture. Um, and how to formalize it. This is a student working for this chapel of St. Catherine <coughs> in Istanbul, actually last year, and uh, he's fascinated with these interiors that have a, an iconog iconographic uh, dimension, they have a symbolic dimension, um, they also have to do with patterns of, of Islam, uh, or because he's Maltese, he's, he's partly <coughs> Christian and he's partly Islamic, he's actually h half Maltese, half uh, Kuwaiti, so you can imagine the, the kind of cultural mix and, and religious uh, juxtaposition that is going on in this. Um, and uh, this is the case where he is uh, doing this uh, 3D uh, printed model uh, with uh, an interpretation of the fall of the dead and, and, and this, this moment of, um, uh, of almost dramatic um, existentialism that I think a lot of the Baroque conversations in our days um, uh, create. Uh, another, another section through another chapel he did actually the year before for Malta. This is another case of a student that was working for a chapel in the catacombs in Rome and the convolution of this, the internal space. This is another case of, of a project for a congregation center in Miami. Um, and this has been one of the most uh, exquisite pieces uh, where uh, Kenny Tsui 
uh, was doing an extension to a, to a chapel in Rome which had three layers. It had the Roman Basilica, it had a Romanesque church, and it had a later, I think, 18th century church on top of it. And San Clemente itself allowed for the extension of one of the chapels. <laughs> And um, Marian uses an interesting term. He talks about the exfoliation of the, of the, of the surface. It's almost like a peeling skin um, that, uh, that creates this. Now, fascinating is when you get into this realm of the ornament, then, which is not decor. In my opinion, the ornament has much more to do with a structural depth or a cultural depth. It's more ingrained with the substance of architecture, whereas the decor is much more superficial. But there was a need also to reconsider how to, to represent it. So it's much more seen from underneath as in, in Baroque cases. And uh, it's obvious that the Baroque for us plays a very important role. Uh, I'm not sure how in, in Syracuse this happens, but the London scene, I would say in very simple terms, is divided by the Gothic, or the, the Gothic guys and the Baroque guys. And it's a, it's a very strong division. There are, there are gray zones in between these two worlds, obviously. And I think they're, they're very interesting. But they are the hardcore liners of the truthfulness of the, of the Gothic structure and the parametrics of it. And they are the extreme guys of the Baroque where the effectfulness and the exuberance and the excess of the uh, theatrical nature of architecture is what matters. And they literally cannot talk to each other. They cannot <laughs> communicate. And it's a, I think it's, we are living in an interesting period to look back at these moments and reconsider them somehow. Uh, now, for me, Rome, when we visited it with the students, where well, we clearly said we are going to see Baroque Rome, we are not going to visit anything else, and we spent 10 days looking at it. Borromini and La Quattro Fontane and so on was obviously the, the sort of mecca for, for these Baroque guys that um, were trying to learn from this period. But what I found really interesting was that as a Portuguese, where the Baroque also matters a lot, Rome had a lot of churches designed by Portuguese architects at the time, which I didn't know because I was passing in the street here and I looked back and thought, this church could be somewhere in Lisbon, but I'm not sure if it's just my eye or in, in reality. And I looked at the, the small plate and thought, that's the Portuguese church in, in Rome. And then we continued walking around and I walked close to the Piazza de, 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 de España. There is this one here and it literally morphs and wobbles the facade and it's in its best of its Baroque uh, mannerisms. And that's again designed by a Portuguese architect, and then there was a Spanish one involved. And here is another one. Now, this just meant for me that the Baroque was really the first global period. It's the first moment, and with Rome as a center, where architects from all over, and probably there were Dutch ones, and there were, I don't know, other Greek ones or, Itali or, or French ones that actually built in Rome at the time. And uh, it meant also that in this globalization process of the Baroque, things were designed in Lisbon or in Amsterdam or in Rome, and then they were fabricated in Jakarta or somewhere in other parts of the world, in Brazil, and then sold to people in Africa or elsewhere. And there was a very interesting exhibition in, in London at the V&A where this statement was made, the Baroque is the first global period of our history. Um, now, the Portuguese Baroque is less tectonic than the other rest of the Baroque, uh, particularly the Italian Baroque. The Portuguese Baroque is far more uh, surface bound because at the time gold was coming and it was actually a recession period as they are experiencing right now again and uh, with a big financial crisis but they had gold but they didn't have actually that much as you imagine so when you see the gilded carvings you think oh there was all the gold available. In fact it was not. <coughs> Interestingly enough I, I read that they did gilded carvings and invented it because gold was scarce. Um, and they didn't have the money to build new churches. So what they did is they took old Gothic or Romanic churches and redesigned them completely in their interior. And they created this absolutely exquisite and extraordinary interiors, uh, which obviously have a reflection also uh, in the South American environment, um, where this voluptuousness and, and uh, theatrical uh, effectfulness is really taken to its almost to its limits. I mean, this is was where I grew up, so you can imagine of how this influenced my understanding. Here, uh, this was a student that took this idea to its extreme and um, 
he, he was considered the, the Gaudi on acid in the London scene when he, when he was uh, uh, nominated for the RBA uh, medals. Um, these are studies into perspectival conditions and how in the Baroque period uh, perspectival distortions uh, were, were created and anamorphosis and how the perspectival understanding of, of architecture can be manipulated. And then one of our memorable students, Sarah Chaffier, in 2007, took these things very seriously and started constructing out of uh, projection cones and visual cones um, a theater of magic, as she called it. Now, this lady was almost computer illiterate. And she came to our unit after we made a presentation and then we had our interviews, and she came to us and said, I don't know anything about 3D and I don't want to do any 3D. Am I in the right place? And uh, we both, being pretty digital and, 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 and into computer stuff, we thought, huh, this is a challenge. And we knew she was very good, so we said, you are in the right place. It's going to be our, our year's challenge to get you through somehow. Now, what she did very cleverly was that in her fifth year, uh, and for those that don't know, usually students stay with us for two years because they do fourth and fifth year. In her fifth year, she learned two commands in Rhino. How to construct a cone and how to intersect two cones. That was basically what she knew. All the rest is 2D stuff and is laser cutting. Um, now what it became was for us quite revealing because different from all the other guys that are much more computer literate and do all the 3D printing and so on and are very much into, into digital manufacturing, this lady didn't know it. But she told us that the combination between the handcrafting and the computational side of things, the computational planning, is actually an incredibly complementary system. So she was drawing it and then, and then laser cutting it, creating it by hand again, redrawing it again, and it went back and forward and back and forward. So these are all different models done throughout the year for this theater of magic where she was studying Baroque anamorphosis um, as well as looking at Houdini and magic and the notion of the, um, of, of, of the perceptual qualities when space is magic in itself. And this is the stage for Houdini, for the elephant or Houdini that disappears. And here you can see kind of the interior complexity that the, that the, the whole stage design acquires in her work. Um, it's one of those cases that as a tutor, you know, I'm profoundly happy that she made, had so much success, but one almost gets jealous because she earned a lot of money with awards that she got with this project. So it's, a, it's one of those moments where you start thinking kind of, what are you doing here? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a funny one. I mean, she's such an extraordinary lady, so it's, a, it's such a pleasure, obviously, to feel that things go so well. But um, this was how the studio looked like, for instance, that particular year. These are the different model uh, experiments that the students were doing. You can recognize the upper one there, which was the extension of San Clemente, and uh, how then um, you know, different uh, drawings and laser cut, three-dimensional drawings were, were created. Um, and then the exhibition in the final year show in 2007, where we designed another Nerdster with some Corian petals on top of it and, and the different exhibits all, uh, all, um, all on, on, on top. Um, lots of people ask us abroad how our students work, and I guess this is the image that uh, mostly explains how they work, as a matter of fact. This comes, it's not our image, it's not our student, this was from the Japanese pavilion in 2004 at the Venice Biennale, which is the otaku, which is the idea of the Japanese sort of young figure um, that lives in any room, it doesn't matter, usually a messy room, but it's the screen and the involvement with the whole world of media that matters. But I found an even better image, which is this one here. <laughs> this was done by somebody at the Royal College of Art, which I found extraordinary. And that, that's the ultimate involvement with the computer screen and, and the world within it. Um, sometimes it's quite useful, actually, when work, people work like that. Sometimes it's good to get rid of it completely and step outside the, the studio <laughs> and, uh, work with, um, and, and work with others. Um, Go too quickly. This is just to show you an exhibition that we uh, had very recently. I curated at Christchurch Spitterfields in London. Um, and now, literally a few weeks ago, 
in, in this beautiful setting. This, for me, was the most happy moment I had in recent times because, uh, you know, it was placing all these Baroque experiments with the designed folds, Baroque folds of the tables in a Baroque environment uh, done by one of the best English architects. And, um, and it, well, it was, you know, the, the moment which we, were just ex which, which we were just waiting because one thing is you exhibit it in the architecture school, the other thing in the gallery. But once you are inside one of these absolutely beautiful buildings, the challenge is 10 times higher. And we spend, I must admit, a lot, a lot of time to get these folds milled, uh, so CNC milled on, uh, on foam. And our aim was to create something like the Bernini folds, something that lies there as if it's fabric, but it's actually made out of something completely different. I'm getting to the last chapter of the, of the talk, um, and that is, has to do with the, what I call the neobiological flash. Uh, and it's a different thing. And there, I, I was just saying that when we were having lunch, for us, th there are two types of extraordinary students. There are those students that, uh, like Sarah Shafia with the Theatre of Magic, that they literally start something new. When they finish their course, others will follow. And they influence the unit for three, four years to come. And then there are the other stu students that are also fascinating, which are the ones that cross over themes and strains of thought. The ones that are not purely just into the Baroque or the sacred or um, perspectival distortions, but they like that, but they like other things as well, and they create a sort of synthesis. And Samuel White, um, actually a few years before, uh, created this chapel extension. He was the guy that started for the first time the discussion about uh, sacred and sublime spaces. But it was also a laboratory as an extension of Wells Cathedral. Because when he started the year, he said, I'm interested in designing and and growing artificial skin. I know somebody in the laboratory, I want to do that. And I thought, okay, that's a good starting point. Why not? Let's see where it goes. So his, in, his interest in, in the biotech and this, this notion that we, in architecture, might be starting to think that designing something that is alive might become part of our profession in the future is right now still a speculation but maybe not that far off. And there has been increasingly more a group of students fascinated with these strange formations. And again, I didn't have a term for this. I, I, I didn't know what to classify them. Because they're not blobs. Blob is too banal right now. It's too basic. And blob, uh, the blob has a purely digital, digitally generated uh, uh, intention. But when you look into the art world again, there are whole group of very strange things that have been done throughout actually even the centuries because you'll see Fortunius Lipsitus in, in the 17th century drawing bizarre formations for the sake of drawing them. He was fascinated with uh, abnormalities and monstrous conditions. Then the 20th century, in particular the late 20th century, is full of this stuff. And the more I look into the art world, the more there is this, this sort of grotesque uh, creations that you don't know what to classify because they're not objects. Um, the, 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 the Australian group, Symbiotica, or in Katz and Yunatsu, they call them semi-living beings. And the film that I found most revealing and most intriguing for us architects and designers was the film by David Cronenberg, Existence. Uh, for those that have seen it, you have these game pods. This is a, the usual story, the game pods are plugged into the body and you, you get into a play in a game. But for me the intriguing thing was that if you, if you imagine that this would be built and done, who would design this bloody thing? Who would do this? For sure not the media or the, the, the game designer because that person doesn't have the knowledge. Neither the surgeon because the surgeon probably has the tools but surgeons come from the medical sciences therefore they have a far more rational understanding of purpose. When it gets into bizarreness like this there probably would be somebody else involved. Um, now, this is a pure speculation, but uh, this led me to, uh, partly, to, to do the editing of neoplasmatic design because there was a lot of stuff going on, in, not just in the Bartlett, but around, of work where biotechnology was seen as, an, as a challenge for architecture. 
and I thought it was a good moment to bring them together in a, in a, in a, in a document, in a publication that could be the basis for other publications to come. And I know uh, that at the Bartlett, Rachel Armstrong, who is a clinical uh, doctor, and Neil Spiller are uh, editing a new AD. Um, and it's, it's following up this theme. Now, when you look at cases of biotech, it's usually very undigital or non-digital. This is Symbiotica with the victimless leather. And I was fascinated with, work and, with their work and still am, I, uh, am because they have a laboratory in, in the University of Western Australia, Perth. Um, and they literally can build these things. It's not they are just talking about it, they do them. They do growing matter uh, in, in reality with all the expertise of staff. But then you get people like um, Heather Ackroy and, and then Harvey, which were cladding these exterior chapels and interior chapels. This one is actually in London, Bilston Grove, with grass. So there's a sense of strangeness that the vertical walls and the ceiling, everything is grown with grass. It's a very bizarre contradiction of what we are used to. Then there's a whole world of green facades that steps into conversations of sustainability and buildings that can be grown. This was the most extreme example I, I found, the wonder wall of, of uh, Van Hoven, where the building literally disappears in this, in this uh, uh, grown uh, surface. Another quite funny one, Francois Roche, uh, with his project in Paris, uh, which he just finished two years ago. It literally disappears in, in one of these courtyards. But they're all non-digital. Even Francois Roche, who was a very, very digital person, did this one without using actually any computer tools. <coughs> I mean, yes, for basic stuff, but not to control what is growing. Then that was another interesting thing. The, the, the group Make uh, in, architecture, uh, in, in London, they, they are an architecture company and they have a research department that is just speculating with cladding buildings with algae farms to reduce the carbon footprint. Um, or the New York-based uh, Culleton McDonald which I wanted very much to be part of this AD because they were the only ones talking about geometry and the role of geometry in um, su uh, minimal surfaces and what they call the new green paradigm. And I found that one as a very, a very important contri um, a contribution from architects. They, they are not actually biotechnological in the straight sense, but there's a potential of that. If you imagine these walls, these Inversibrain uh, project walls, inhabited with uh, biotechnology and I would imagine that they would need microbiologists and, and environmentalists and ecologists and so on to work on this then they, they could become really quite fascinating. <laughs> I flipped through these ones this is Francois Roche who I just mentioned before I think he's a very seminal character at, at this period of time because he's probably the only one that bridges the digital conversation with the biotechnological and I heard that there was a conference at USC in Los Angeles, so, uh, I think in December, where he was invited and there was Patrick Schumacher. And the conclusion of, of this uh, conference on, on digital architecture was that Francois Roche was a step further of Patrick Schumacher because Patrick was still in the param um, parametric move, whereas Francois Roche was beyond that already one step. And I found that really quite... Uh, wonderful that they got to that conclusion because it didn't happen in London when he was part of the conference in, in London in September. But do you see this is just the, 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 the sort of drawings that Francois Roche is, is doing and then this was his um, installation he did for the Copenhagen exhibition um, in 2009 and that's quite amazing because this is a, bi a biopolymer that can be uh, decayed with these sprinklers that exist on, on, on the top of these bits and so this is completely humid all the time and it's gradually decaying that's why he called this, uh, this necrose as a project and that influenced some of the students we had uh, uh, at, at UCLA and the Bartlett students that went there to do a workshop this is a guy working with um, corn based composites and the possibility of creating material with that so this is a, it's a set of drawings he did for a Lisbon facade for a small chapel where he's saying these, uh, this biocomposite could gradually be taken over by plants and birds and, and, and whatever and it would become this completely mutating uh, environment. Very important in all this discussion is materiality. Now, 
that is quite incredible because these are engineers sitting at the University of Delft uh, talking about bioconcrete. And it's the idea to, to infuse concrete with uh, extremophiles, as they call them, which is with bacteria. And the bacteria heals the concrete back into its original state. It, it will be a complete revolution if this is going to be turned into practice because the problems we have with all decaying concrete buildings that cost us a fortune to replace or to refurbish will be um, solved with a very, very um, easy and cheap way. The problem, I guess, is that it looks ugly right now and therefore they haven't gone beyond what this is. And you don't want the buildings to look like that and you can't paint over it anyway because it's alive. The other thing I heard is that it doesn't stop growing. <laughs> So you can't stop them. Once these extremophiles are there, they're happy in their environment, and they continue eating the concrete and transforming it, and there they are. Now, how do you get into the concrete and stop them? You can't. So I, I, I guess that it, it would be like a virus in the concrete, and then you, you never can get rid of them. Um, a very important also aspect in all this is how do you draw stuff that is growing and has to do with life somehow? And the drawing techniques are still quite traditional. I mean, this is the François Roche drawing for his uh, building in the courtyard of, of Paris. This was the Van Hoven one. And this is a diagram of Corlett and MacDonald. But they're quite still very much in the canon on, and the codes that we use in architectural drawing so far. Interesting were these ones that Corlett and MacDonald were working with Arab to work on these different iterations of geometry to find the most um, efficient and optimized geometries for uh, environmental control. Uh, or these, this student at the uh, University of Westminster using a very simple two-dimensional diagram to design a bioreactor, or using real uh, flow studies for uh, flows of algae in, uh, in, in the roof of a building. And Sam White that I mentioned before, uh, who was the seminal ca character that kind of crossed bred um, the biotech and, and, the, and the, the conversation of sacred and sublime, working on, still at the beginning of his project, with scale 100 to 1, which was a really puzzling thing. You think 1 to 100, yes, we know that. I don't know what the, 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 uh, the, um, the terminology is here in the US. I know your metric system is completely different. I never can read it when, when we get competitions from the US. But uh, uh, we, we talk about scale 1 to 100, 1 to 50, etc. This guy was talking about an invisible scale within the Petri dish and, and uh, discussing it with uh, microbiologists. And so you can see here, this is the cellular pattern which he was creating. And I found that he created one extraordinary image. It's a constructed drawing uh, which shows the quality of, of liquidity within the Petri dish in this very small scale, implying that we might be uh, uh, challenge to draw on much smaller scales in the future when these scales might have a very strong impact on a larger scale. Um, for instance, for the extremophiles of, of a bioconcrete, for instance, we might have to design them on, 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 a, on an invisible scale. On another case, which is actually quite old, it's already almost 12 years old, this lady, who was not part of our unit, was the first one that I know, uh, at least so far, that was combining different drawing codes the code of, of the biologist, the drawing of the, um, of the chemist, and the drawing of the architect. Uh, because she was saying, if you just use strictly the architectural language, you cannot really talk about growth patterns and, and introduce the data that you need. And she has, I mean, nobody else has so far taken this further, and I think there's an enormous potential in, in this uh, respect. Uh, how are we doing with time? Is it? Um, um, I flipped through these ones because I just wanted to show you, since uh, you know, neoplasmatic design is, is lying here, and uh, I even heard that you, you suggested it to your students, I wanted to explain a few things. And this is something I find interesting, is to look at what visualization processes they have in these, uh, in, in these fields, where they are scanning as we are, where they're constructing three-dimensional models and reconstructing them uh, with high precision with CT scans and MRN scans and so on, using our three-dimensional visualization tools, um, and then you know, creating them in such mold that then it can operate on them and use um, uh, robots and other 
uh, and other instruments to operate. This is also quite fascinating, the tele-immersion technology. That means that the surgeons using helmets with all the, the uh, data on it in a virtual three-dimensional manner telling them what they should do. Uh, then you have the robots and so on, which are these kind of things. And then when you look at that one, it's interesting how that looks, almost as, as an architect is sitting here and having a kind of 3D printer or something next to it. So there's a certain relationship between these two worlds of the surgeon having the instruments to work with something that is alive. And in fact, when at the Bartlett we got the first CNC milling machine, it came from medical sciences. That was the big wow effect. They didn't want it anymore. It was too old. We got it. It was the first one, and it was done for prosthetics. Now, it turned upside down, inverse the situation. Now we have a, 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 such a sophisticated uh, workshop that we do stuff for the medical sciences. So that's where we get a lot of money from. So we don't do the prosthetics straight away, but we do all the 3D models that they need before doing the final prosthetics. And that's because the software and the machinery is actually pretty much on, on both sides. Um, so it makes us think somehow, what, where is this going, all the, the, whole, the whole conversation with, um, with uh, growth and so on. Uh, another seminal project, which was done in the year 2003, is of this guy that created six vessels, and he prepared them with the microbiologists and with growth medium, and he placed it in different places in London, in different uh, uh, conditions. And what he found out was that the bacteria in the air was having completely different responses and reactions on these vessels. That means the bacteriological quality of air that has to do with who we are and what program and what use we give to the space uh, was having a different reflection on these surfaces. So the fungi growing on it was very different. This is in a bakery, for instance. And this was the carpet environment of the Bartlett. And uh, I think some of these were like in the tube station. That means that what he was saying is that our air is not sterile. Our air is loaded with bacteria. And if our walls are more responsive to it, if they can monitor what is going around in, in the air, then, then we have a, a kind of constantly mutating responsive environment. To create some of the models, he had to leave the building. And he was working in these interdisciplinary groups. So you see him using incubators uh, at UCL or doing glass blowing at the Royal College of Arts, uh, doing CNC milling, uh, doing some vacuum forming, uh, and then using even traditional scanners behind this, this kind of growth patch. And altogether, it started creating these, these vessels. So the ones that have these uh, humidifiers that create al always a certain level of moisture that allow the, the growth medium uh, to, to absorb um, the bacteria, and here one of those already grown. And that's another uh, version of another model he did actually for Holborn Station in the period where the London uh, terrorist attacks happened. So these guys, they were very interested in actually working on this technology because the, these bio monitors uh, and sensors were very much part of the conversation at the time. Now I'm getting to an end and I just wanted to show you a few images that have to do with what the fascination is, at least at the Bartlett, with artificial ecologies. This is a whole chapter. There are lots of people that are fascinated with the possibility that ecologies can be artificially created. Now, it, our natural ecologies are so messed up by humans anyway that you hardly can ever see any ecological system that is still purely natural. There's, a, there's such a blurry boundary between both. Um, this is a group of people talking about um, uh, students of work where they're trying to synthetically construct these, uh, these environments. Um, they often have technical, often not, they always have technical stations where they, with engineers and other people, work uh, these things out in much, which, um, or with much more technical accuracy. Um, there's the role of the parametric, obviously, in all this. And then this case of somebody that was obsessively interested and creating an architecture that reflects the program that was a, a, a biofuel farm. Placed in this villa uh, Gualini in Turin, so it's actually quite beautiful setting on, on a hill, uh, watching across the river um, uh, the city. But he started with looking at 
these um, genetic engineered seeds and, and growth uh, principles and spoke about mutant specimens, uh, specimen uh, or in vitro growth or a, a series of inventions of incubators and uh, fertilizers, germinators, seed spreading and nutrient receptors, all sorts of stuff that with Rachel Armstrong, the clinical um, the doctor who was giving him support, he was designing. Uh, in a way, he was bored with the, the engineer's design uh, of, of, of medical equipment. He was saying the medical equipment is very boring. It looks a bit like um, you know, our old sci-fi movies. Uh, it's a bit like uh, Space Odyssey and so on. It's a bit old-fashioned. We have, we have uh, overcome that already. Uh, so he was trying to transcend that with uh, growth systems and uh, partly robotic systems. Uh, this, is a, this is using software to um, predict and visualize uh, growth evolutions on, on these biotechnological scaffolds. Sorry, another, another one of these iterations on a larger scale. Uh, these green facades of, of the laboratories of this biofuel farm. Another fuel production plant. The laboratory pods. So details into, into how the canopy could have these growing follicles that are responsive and absorbent of uh, humidity in the air. This one part of a, of, a, of a larger canopy. Different iterations of, of, of also the form. Um, and then in plan, this bizarre monster, with in, which in section looked uh, like that, which he was um, developing. And um, more finalized images of how this all together with these different areas that he quite clearly um, differentiated and where the building itself responds to its environment very carefully, not just internally, but also externally. <coughs> and that kind of previous image would lead me to have a conversation about what I just very recently started talking about. Is there an urban flash? Could I extend it even into a large scale? I'm not sure. I wrote an article about inside-out uh, inside urbanism. But I guess this would take me much longer in this lecture, so I thought I'd stop here. And um, maybe in a few years' time, I would be able to talk about my urban understanding of, of things. Um, thank you very much. Um, one of your slides um, referring to the biotech forms, um, you stated that it was, it was not a blob, but uh, you had a very difficult time defining it. And it made me think how there are so many uh, abstract forms that don't really reference anything, but we have uh, a real easy time identifying those as either grotesque and monstrous or beautiful. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight to what makes such an abstract form give us um, just a, you know, we can uh, identify such a, an adjective with that. Good question. I mean, um, I guess when you see how these projects usually start, they never start with that and they never start with purely f formal uh, speculations. They usually start with very programmatically led conversations. It's about studies of the program. And I'm not sure if this is something English, but it's for sure not Southern European from where I came from. But I learned in the UK, in the London scene, that program is a great opportunity to make you creative. But it's if you subvert the program, if you find in the program something that other people haven't seen. And when I not so long time ago, I went back to Barcelona, where I also studied for two years, and I went back to look at Gaudi. I think Gaudi did it very cleverly, because in the time where Gaudi was working, he had his, had his, very, had his uh, very clear geometric and structural agenda. He was actually very wise structurally and spatially, and he had a real knowledge of 
getting the best craftsmen in town to work for him. But when you look at the buildings, they had the same type of clients as the other architects had as well. There were the emergent bourgeois society of, of Catalonia at the time, uh, with lots of money, they were new rich and they wanted exuberant stuff. But all the other houses that you see in the Barcelona and Sanchez, but which have beautiful facades, are actually quite straightforward buildings in the back of it. Beautiful pavements and so on, but architecturally speaking are quite straightforward. Because there are a set of rooms, living room, shaft, certain ventilation shafts and that's it. Gaudi always looked into something else. He started looking into the relationship of a first floor with a third floor with a hidden staircase where the mate could walk through. And he thought, was that necessary? Probably not, but he introduced it. Or a secondary staircase in the back that created another strange ventilation shaft which didn't need to ventilate anything. Or the kitchen placed in a different part of the, of the building. And when you start looking at it, what he was doing, he was reinventing the program very, very, very cleverly to his benefit to legitimize a lot of the variations that he created. And the Casa Ballo, for instance, is a typical case where the small staircase that exists that links two floors plus an extra entrance for the family from a side entrance, not the main entrance, creates a shaft in the place where the room levels don't work. So what does he have to do? In one of the rooms he has to raise the floor. What does it create? The piano corner. In a, in, in a building that actually has a very straight section system, it's this guy playing with the opportunity that there is a complexity, inherent spatial complexity, structural complexity, that comes very much from interpreting what the needs were of the families that were living in these buildings. And I think there's a lot to learn from that. That means that you get, a, you, I mean, the students in our case always choose their own program, always, and they choose their own sites wherever you go. That means that when somebody comes from any city, being it Los Angeles or in China somewhere, whatever, they have spent a, t a certain amount of time looking for the, the, the type of area of town where they would like to work because there's something culturally interesting going on or it relates to their previous projects. And they usually start drawing quite intuitively what they felt. And the probably quite organic, expressive formations that you have seen here in many of these cases is when the students are far more developed, when they are actually very, very skilled already with software, where they have, when they have an incredible control and they're bored by doing straight buildings and they're actually challenged and trying to challenge the geometry of the buildings to its success. I wouldn't be surprised if in two years' time or three years' time almost the opposite would start emerging. I wouldn't be surprised at all when they get bored of this when they start saying, I don't care about the excessive contortions, as we call them, the convolutions of geometry, and actually they become interested in something more simpler. I, I, you know, much more simple. I wouldn't be surprised. But there is an incredible dexterity that these, these people develop with computer software and how they swap from one into another and so on. Therefore, they, they want to be challenged and they want to take the language somehow further. And in our environment, I mean, obviously, driven by my influence and also Marian's, we are very keen on discussing <coughs> language. And we are keen on discussing a language which is something partly personal, but it's also partly to do with the technology that it implies, the client that you have, the context where you're working. But language matters because that's the way in which we communicate. And uh, therefore, the modes in which we communicate means the medium that you use matters as well. I don't think it's irrelevant. It's not by the way you could do it in any other way. No, no, no. It's exactly the way you do it that matters a lot in how you communicate. And if you're really good in what you're doing, then you can elaborate your speech very well. And it happens with us when somebody has an extraordinary vocabulary. You usually tend to have a much more expressive, elaborate, sophisticated way in which you communicate. Um, and. Uh, and I think in architecture that has, that has definitely a, a, a reflection on, on the way in which students try to push the limits of, of language of, and, and the boundaries of what they can achieve. Uh, we are, as I said, I, I, I clearly exposed my bias. We are interested in the Baroque, so we are interested in the excess. We, we, 
we love it because not of the expense or the effort, it's more to do with the extraordinary feelings and hapticity that these spaces have. Um, I feel exhilarated if I'm in these, in these places. I, I feel them absolutely mind-blowing. And to some extent, I think we live in a Baroque period because we live in a period where these incredible contradictions exist in our world of high levels of starvation with the most exuberant and absurd spendings on some oligarchs that spend money on I don't know what, you know, it's, it's just, if you rationalize what's going on in the world, it's completely bonkers, it's completely mad. It's sick, actually. But the Baroque was about that as well. It was a very existential moment of the most incredible palaces and churches being built in a period where Europe was partly even wiped out with plagues and diseases and things like that. So I think there's a sense of attraction by the tragic and the, and the beautiful somehow. Of, of that, what we are going through. And, uh, and as I said, I think the, the, the digital revolution is allowing us to play with an ornamental quality in a different mode that the modernists didn't allow to because the modernists went for cleanliness, they went for purity, they went for things that we are trying to contradict in this period uh, and, and go beyond. I have an, uh, another question. Um, thanks for a great presentation, Marcos. I've been drawing some comparisons between your practice and the practice of Diller and Scofidio, for whom flesh is also an important concept. And I've been thinking about the way it operates for them politically and disciplinarily. And I'm trying to, to kind of come to grips with the difference between your practice and their practice, because media and representation are clearly extremely important for both. But they seem to somehow position the body and its relationship to representation. They tend to represent the body. It's the representation of the body. Whereas with your work, it seems to be representation as body. Yeah. In a weird way, it seemed to be point, excuse me, pointing to a kind of post-representational paradigm, possibly. I don't think it's necessarily post-critical, but a kind of a post-representational assertion that you seem to be making, one where it's not about depiction or reference, but where it's about actual kind of mobilization of life or body or flesh. It's, it's interesting because I have been wondering about this issue of illustrating, constructing the body for quite a while. And if I think there is on the one hand a real learning curve with our body that we still need to to have and particularly because the body is something that is shifting in terms of our understanding as i showed at the beginning it's not something static it's not something that we should take for granted that means reconsidering who we are and what sort of body is inhabiting architecture nowadays i think is an important issue on the other hand i think a lot of architects a lot those that feel that they need to introduce the body in their architecture and to their drawings when they're conceiving models or drawings, I don't think necessarily create an architecture that is more experiential. And I, I didn't find any conclusion. I, I don't have a recipe for that. But so far, I have been shying away of drawing too many bodies in my drawings, in my architecture, because I don't, I don't think it does the, 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 the job for me. But I would say that when Martin and I discuss architecture, we are constantly describing the experiential side of things. And if I did it already before coming to, to London, I'm sure I started doing it even more, also because of Peter's influence. Uh, when, you, when you think about the Kunsthausgrads, the only thing that we really discussed architecturally was the Guggenheim in New York. That was the paradigm that we were discussing all the time. There was no discussion about Archigram or there was no discussion about other buildings. It was about the Guggenheim. What was the challenge beyond the Guggenheim? The Guggenheim? Now, what was being discussed was the experience through the building all the time. Hey, you can go up here and so on. And then wouldn't it be great if you feel that from one moment to another, you wah, there you feel this big space. And Peter in his expressive mode, describing what he felt. And I think the project became really interesting when there was a mutual interference of experiences that we were 
describing to each other. And I'm sure that everybody that sat in that room, which was Matis, Niels Jonkans, Colin and Peter and myself, we all visited a lot of buildings. Obviously Colin and Peter many more because they were much older. But it was all the time about describing the great sensation we had in different buildings. It was not about the concept itself. The only moment was about the pin and skin. That was a conceptual move, absolutely, 100%. He took the pens, Peter took the pens of Alexander, of his son, and scribbled something because there was a dramatic point where the building was square and had a ramp and it went on and on and on and nobody could solve it. And there was a crisis moment and then um, there was this complete shift in a completely different direction saying, why is it not all in this bloody skin and we have a pin which is a ramp and nothing else. And that's, that's the building. That was a completely hardcore conceptual move. But all the rest was discussing what you feel. And when the building was done, and I was not part of the construction team, when it was built, I was there twice, once during the construction and when it was open. And I was amazed of how experientially rich this building was, because I think that's the strength. There are many details and things that, you know, I was part of the team that I personally, I wouldn't say I don't like, I would have solved them differently. Um, I think it's a great piece, but you know, you can debate about what it does in the city, etc. But it's the variety of experiences that you have. I think it's the different moods you go through in this building that I think are extraordinary. And there's a highlight for me, which is when you achieve what they call the needle, which is this uh, suspended um, cantilever uh, volume that exists on the top floor, which Peter was very keen on keeping all the time because he needed to disrupt the the curvilinearity of, of the building. He, he said, that we need something to disrupt it, otherwise it, be, it overkills it, it becomes too boring. But the beauty, I think, of that moment is when you're having three times crossing or, or, or being experienced simultaneously. You look at the Baroque town, which is Graz, with all its roofs and, uh, and, um, and church, church towers. You are in this sublime moment of the 19th century, we're kind of, oh, you know, that's what you do. You come up and say, oh, wow, that's a beautiful sense. It's absolutely 19th century sublime. It's Caspar David Friedrich in its best depicting the great moment within the building that I think is a 21st century building, which is actually to be in the skin of this building and a skin that doesn't tell what the interior is about. It's actually not an honest skin. It's a mediatized skin that does something else that doesn't have anything to do with the, in with the inside. <laughs> In, its, in itself a communicator somehow. In it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a screen that tells a story to the outside that doesn't have to do with the inside. And there is this, this kind of juxtaposition of experiential conditions that one can interpret that I find fascinating. How do you bring it in into your architecture when you're designing? I'm, I'm not sure, there's, again, there's no really, not really a rule, but I think it's about the way in which you discuss the architecture while you're drawing it and conceiving it and formalizing, etc., without necessarily the, the, me, the, the need for my side to put the body figures in at least yet. You know, I, 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 I designed bits of bodies and uh, did lots of collages with bodies, but they didn't do the job. So I, um, that's how I, I felt. I mean, for instance, the Lisbon uh, project for us was very revealing again because we never drew people. Maybe we should have done, but we never did it. But we were describing it again experientially. And when the building was open and people took over these steps and started sitting around wherever they were, and a few days later when we were there, the exhibition or the, exhibition, or the, the, the book fair was already open, open and you know, the, the, the visitors were sitting there and they didn't have a clue that somebody designed it. They just, oh, there's a cafeteria, there we are watching the views, spotting somebody giving a talk in the lecture hall, drinking a coffee, having a chat with the neighbor, sitting in these steps, that was the momentum somehow. And I felt that was a, a contribution, that the building was not just scratching the floor, as they called it, the, the, you know, the locals called it the red lizard. It was not just kind of finding its, its, its position in, in this actually rather complicated um, uh, geometry <coughs> that the park had, but also the fact that people were embedded in it, and they belonged 
to the building somehow, and I found that really, really good. I mean, the, the means, you know, if I tell you it cost like 15, uh, 500,000 euros for the whole of the book fair, including stands and everything. So this building cost hardly anything, and it was built with scaffolds, with scaffolding structure inside, which was ridiculous, because that's what you use usually to construct the buildings, and then you take it away when, when the building is done. This one didn't even have foundations, because the scaffolds had small wooden pieces, and they were literally thousands of them. And that's why the building could stand, because it has all, had all these scaffolds. So it was not the high-tech side of things, it was actually the low-tech that was the challenge. Thank you, Evan.